Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. Now that we've learned how to make use of reinforcement learning in Python, let's see how we can run this completely inside of the OpenAI gym. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. Now we're going to look at deep reinforcement learning. We're not going to build this from scratch in Keras. We're going to use a Python package that supports it for us. And we'll look at it in both this section and the next part so that we can see how it's used. In this part, we're going to create just a simple Q learning, deep Q learning trainer that will learn how to run the cart pull experiment. We'll see the cart pull experiment in a moment. It's basically looking at how well a cart can balance a pole on top of it as it moves across the screen. Now, if you look at Q learning, which is what we saw in the previous part, essentially you have a state in some environment and it looks up in a Q table and it figures out whatever the best action is to do. Now usually this action is a series of Q values for each of those particular actions and that lets it choose from one of those. And it results in, in giving you essentially for each state what the correct action would be and what maybe the second to the best action would be. Now we're going to replace that with a deep neural network and it's essentially going to pass out to you. We'll have all these states like we had before. It'll pass through layers of the deep neural network and it'll output for each of those states what it feels the best Q value is. Now the advantage that we're moving towards here, and we'll see this again and again in the next two parts after this part, we'll see that the real advantage of the neural network, the deep neural network over the table is that the neural network is able to not have to store a separate distinct Q value for every single combination of states because we'll see that there can be a lot of states in these complicated games. Card pull is not too bad. It's just a first step towards it. But in the Atari game breakout that we're dealing with next where we have to look literally at the entire screen, there's a lot of states. And then when we get to Go and Chess, there's a tremendous number of states and the neural network can generalize and not have to store each of those states as individual discrete values. The neural network can generalize and realize that some of these are the same and reuse some of the same learning across multiple states. When we get into learning to play Go and chess, we'll see that the neural network literally learns to predict the next move and doesn't have to form a tree for every single value that's in the game of Go or chess. It can strip off certain branches that are just simply not worth exploring because we know that they lead to a bad state in the game. Now we're going to use a Python package called Keras RL. It's one of the list of packages that I tell you to install when we're setting up for this course. And it's fully compatible with TensorFlow 2.0 at this state, so that is quite good. Problem though with Keras RL is the documentation is really pretty limited for it. It works quite well, but the authors have not particularly documented it well. So I've started to make some notes here as far as what some of the key parameters that you're passing into this thing are actually for. I may well push these up to the actual real Keras RL just to contribute something back on these because I've been making notes as far as what the various objects are used for as I've been using it. We'll be using the CEM agent primarily and the parameters that you pass into it model. So you do build this neural network in Keras, usually as a sequence, completely separately. You build it up, you have it ready to go, and you pass it in. Now, even though this is deep reinforcement learning, you've got to deal with all the deep neural network sort of hyperparameters as well. So you've got to decide how many layers you're going to have. Are you going to use convolutional layers? Are you going to use potentially any of the features that you have available in Keras? NB actions, that's the number of actions. So how many actions can you take at each point? These tend to deal really better with what you call discrete actions. So the action is either left, right, up, down, fire. They don't deal as much, although re there's nothing in reinforcement learning that stops you. You can certainly do continuous action reinforcement learning. We're not going to get into that, but you can. That is where you would deal with how hard a button is pushed. Like think of the gas pedal or brake in your car. Your brake is not on or off. 
you can push the brake down very hard and stop very quickly or you can just barely tap it and you'll just slow down a little bit. Same thing for the gas pedal. You can floor it or you can just edge it forward just tapping it like when you're moving around in a tight situation. The memory is very important. The memory essentially it's usually going to be the episode per parameter memory. This is how you build the training data for your neural network. The memory is essentially keeping track of which states resulted in good outcomes and rewards being issued. So as it builds up that memory that is going to build up what your neural network is actually training on. And you get to specify how big the memory is and, and certain things. Batch size. This is exactly a neural network hyperparameter. This is simply how many from the memory how many values you wish to train on in your individual batches. Warm-up is important and this is this was discussed in a number of the papers on reinforcement learning but you're essentially taking the game through a number of, of, of episodes. You may want a number of episodes at the beginning to not really count because it's really just establishing the memory and which outputs which actions actually resulted in rewards. So this is kind of a, the warm-up period. It doesn't count. It's it's for free. It's just no training is actually being affected. Just how many episodes you want to get through before you're going to actually start training. The train interval, this is really your logging interval and it defines how often you want output from this. Elite fraction, this kind of gets towards simulated annealing. How much of your particularly best policies that you've come up with, do you want retained and not potentially scrolled off as new things are learned? That can cause you to degrade performance. How greedy do you want to be? So if you're very greedy, you may not degrade your performance, but you may not learn as quickly as you would if you were more liberal on what you're going to accept. And then the environment is the open AI environment that you wish to be using. Number of steps when you're calling fit, both of these two are for calling fit. Just how many steps do you want to train it for? Neural network steps. And visualize if true, it's going to show you your results as an actual video game playing on your screen. Usually you don't want to visualize until you're done training, then you want to see what the final thing looks like. And verbose is just the amount of output that you want on this. So here's a simple example running cart poll. I am going to go ahead and run this. This is literally an example right from Kara's RL. So this is not something that I that I put together, but let me explain to you sort of what it's doing. I'm going to go ahead and run it and make sure that it gets started up. So yeah, there it goes. It is generating. So we can confirm that it's running. This thing spews a lot of output as it goes. And when it's finally done, we'll call test with visualize true and you'll get to see it run five episodes of cart poll. So that gives us something to look forward to. So we'll go ahead and run this just to explain this while it's running. We set up the environment. The environment name is Cartpole. Now what's interesting is you could run this on the mountain car that we were looking at in the previous part. It, it It's kind of overkill for that and it doesn't really... I haven't found a good set of parameters to get mountain car to particularly work well with a deep neural network. We'll see this really shine in the next part where we actually make use of breakout and teach it how to how to use an entire screen as input. We do set some seeds. The example had these seeds, so I just went ahead and continue. By the way, there's cart pull. See how it learns to balance that cart. Learns to balance the pull on the cart, actually. This is the neural network. It actually uses a pretty simple neural network. It looks like whoever was creating the example is trying with a much deeper neural network as well. I didn't get particularly good results with that, so this one seemed to be completely sufficient. You do want your output layer to have the number of actions, so you always set these up as a classification neural network, where it's classifying essentially the input, which is the state, into what next action should take. We'll see this over and over again. That is always how this works in terms of the input is whatever the state is, so when we learn to play Go with this, it's the Go board and the output is going to be whatever action should be taken. Print the model summary. We set up our, uh, this is the episode memory, so we have a thousand policies that it can remember. The window is pretty light. It's it's not remembering a lot of time series. You could make this bigger and that would 
memorize more time series. You have to be aware though, if you increase this, you also have to change your neural network. This one corresponds to the one up here. So the, the input is basically whatever this is times the size of your, your state coming into it. So if your state is just one, then it's going to be, those, those would be the same values. In the case of mountain car, it would be whatever this is times two up here. Then we fit it over 100,000 steps, not visualizing verbose. You might want to set that lower because that does, that does spew quite a bit of output. And we do save the best model at the end. We save just the weights so that we could reload it if we wanted to. You would load the weights into a CM that was structured to be the same, same approximate type and size. And then finally we tested over five episodes. So this is showing you really just how you make use of Kira's RL. Kira's reinforcement learning, which are these two. In the next part, we're going to look at how we can actually use this to play an Atari game, and that gets very interesting. Thank you for watching this video. In the next video, we're going to see how to take on more complex Atari video games. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.